Nice to meet you all. My name is Kev. I'm one of the doctors working at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals in the UK. So welcome to the next webinar in the Mind the Bleak Radiology series. So last week we looked at CT head scans. Uh, tonight we'll be learning about chest x-rays. So chest x-rays are one of, if not the most common plain films that we request in the hospital, but the interpretation of it is notoriously quite difficult and the findings can be quite subtle. So Dr. Rakamurari, who's one of the consultant radiologists at Rotherham Hospital, is going to be teaching us a structured approach to chest x-ray interpretation, uh, go through some common cases and some frequent pitfalls. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll send you links to the feedback forms to fill in, and after you complete that, you should get a certificate uh, sent to you by email. Um, so Raka, I'll hand over to you if you'd like to take it away. Hello. Can you hear me, Kevin? Yes, I think everyone can hear you now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I'm just going to start my video. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening and welcome to the webinar um, about chest x-rays um, and how to interpret it. Um, so um, my name is Rekha and as Kevin said, I'm a consultant radiologist at the Rotherham Foundation Trust. So. Um, So the objectives of today's um, uh, today's um, webinar is to have a system to approach the chess film. So we're going to go through the system that I use and many of us use uh, to approach a chess film, which is quite important. Um, and then we will go through a few cases or on chest X-ray with the pathologies and recognize um, how to diagnose them uh, and some uh, salient features to help recognize the pathologies. And in the end, we'll go through um, some of the chest X-rays with NG tube positions and uh, misplaced NG tubes, uh, uh, most importantly, because um, I know that uh, uh, that is something that uh, the junior doctor um, come across in day-to-day -day, uh, practice. So first comes first. Um, so even before looking at a chest x-ray, we need to um, make sure to look at few things. One is the identification of the patient. Um, so it's not only, a, it's very important, not only just um, in surgical or other specialty, but it's as important also in radiology To uh, So we always make sure we look at the patient's name and identification and also uh, the date of the examination. And uh, it, um, it's always relevant to look at the patient's demographics like age and gender, because when we see a pathology on the chest X-ray, uh, it becomes very relevant because some pathology are more common uh, in some age group and also in some gender. So uh, important to look at the age and gender. Um, and uh, the third thing is the technical quality of the film. So for example, an, is it an AP or PA view? Uh, the standard for performing a chest X-ray is a PA view where the radiation um, doses from the backside and the patient is opposed uh, or to the screen. And um, this is ideal where, you know, uh, this is the best, um, uh, this is the best um, X-ray because then the scapulas are out of the lung fields um, and also um, the exposure is, um, is uh, optimum. Uh, sometimes we'll have to, the radiographers have to do an AP view, which is an posterior view, um, for example, in a patient that is poorly or, or especially in the ITU settings. Um, so uh, in this situation, the radiographer generally mentions on the film as AP and whether it is supine or erect. And uh, it's very important to also look at the degree of inspiration. And the way to determine that is to count, one of the things is to look at the lung fields um, and um, in general, and also count the ribs. Um, for example, for a good uh, degree of inspiration, it, we should be able to count, uh, um, so for it, so we should be able to count at least six ribs anteriorly and at least 10 ribs posteriorly. 
which is a good uh, inspiration film. The next thing we look at it is, is the penetration optimal. Um, so the way to look at it is when we look in the spine, you know, just behind the heart there, it should just be visible. So if it's, if it's not visible at all, it is under penetrated. And if it is uh, too much visible, then it is over penetrated film. And also, of course, look at the rotation. If there is any rotation, uh, by looking at the distance of the uh, of the clavicle uh, from the spinous processes in the midline. So even again, uh, after after this, after looking at all these, um, again, when, before starting an approach to chest X-ray, I always if especially in the IQ patients, I always try to um, look at any lines uh, and that should, and also assess its position and intactness before we start the approach. Otherwise, there's a tendency to miss it uh, in the end. So this is the systematic approach. So um, the order of it is, doesn't really matter. Some people use a different order, but the most important thing is you adopt a system and you look at it in certain order and you continue to do it over and over the same thing. So it becomes uh, a, a, like a second nature. And in that, in that way, you do not miss any, um, any pathology and you do not miss any, any subtle abnormalities on the x-ray. So the, uh, let's talk about the lung fields. So um, it's uh, on a chest X-ray, it's always, um, we know that there are two lungs. So and the way I look at it is looking at the lung fields, comparing the right with the left uh, at upper zones and then middle zones and then the lower zones. Um, we generally can't see oblique uh, fissures, but we should be able to see just about to see uh, horizontal fissures sometimes, um, especially when it's a normal chest X-ray. And that generally runs from the uh, right hilum up to the, um, up to the sixth um, rib on, in the mid axillary line. But actually on this one, I don't think I can really um, see it, but that's normal. Um, and uh, uh, next is hilum. So the right hilum and the left hilum. So there are three things that we have to look uh, when we're looking at the hilum. Uh, first is the position. We know that the left hilum is generally placed higher than the right. And second is the density of the hilum. The density of the right hilum should always match with the left hilum and it shouldn't be too dense. Um, and the third thing is that, that it should be concave. If you put an angle there, it should be obtuse and it should look concave. So that's, that's the angle there. So um, if it became convex, I would be worried that there, there's possibly a pathology in there. Um, and then uh, the third thing I would look at is the mediastinum, superior to uh, to up to the uh, level of the diaphragm. So it should generally have a well-defined margin throughout. Um, that some fuzziness is allowed in the, um, uh, in, in, in the area that the superior mediastinum from uh, uh, epicis to the uh, hilum and also in the right um, cardiophrenic angle. Uh, but generally it should have a well-defined margins to it. Um, and then uh, is the diaphragm. So basically the, the right diaphragm is higher than the left diaphragm. And the way to remember is that the cardiac, because the heart is always towards the right, towards the left, it pushes the left diaphragm. Um, sorry, I think we should have, yeah, the heart, uh, after the mediastinum, it's the heart. Uh, so again, the, the shape of the um, heart, and the size of the heart and also the margins of the heart should be really well defined. So the right heart border is made of right atrium and the right appendages and then the superior vena cava and the superior aspect. And the left heart border is made of the left ventricle and the left uh, atrium and then the aortic knuckle here. So, um, so that, and then you should also look for any uh, density or a mass which is hidden behind the heart as well. Um, so um, 
and then the bones um very important because most of the most of the time it, um you know bone lesions are uh, generally uh, subtle and can be missed especially if it is a metastasis or uh, things like that so it has uh, the bone review is very important um Initially, I used to, when I was a uh, first year registrar, I remember asking the consultants, how do you count ribs? It's so complicated. It, I, I always miss it. But uh, the more and more I did it, I, I knew it was, um, it was just, you know, getting into the practice of uh, following through each um, each rib and then also not forgetting to look at the clavicle and also the peripheries of the film which is like you know uh, a shoulder joint and uh, sometimes um, you know subtle metastasis into the scapula and 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 also of course the spine um so after this um, systematic approach of each uh, each field it's important again to have a review area. It can be different for different people. It can be, you know, uh, making sure if you've missed something on a film, then the next time that becomes your review area every time you see a chest x ray. So, um, generally, review areas are the apices where people can miss a very small uh, pancos tumor, which is very significant when, you know, it's, uh, it's important to find it early on. Um, and uh, uh, paratracheal stripe. This is the paratracheal stripe. Generally, it's allowed to be as thick as three to five millimeters. Um, and uh, so the things that we are going to look for in the paratracheal stripe is one is the thickness that it shouldn't be more than five millimeter and also the density. If you can see that density on the right paratracheal stripe kind of matches with the left there, even though the left is not so obvious. Um, and if there was an increased density, then I would be worried that there's, there's possibly some lymph nodes or some mass there. And um, the third review area for me is the retrocardiac, um, because, uh, um, you know, there could be a mass sitting there just behind the heart. So um, retrocardiac is always my review area. Um, and then, of course, the costophrenic angles. Sometimes um, there could be a, there could be like a, yeah, pure effusion, of course. And then they could, sometimes there could be uh, mass sitting in there as well. And uh, you can also add uh, under the diaphragm, gas under the diaphragm, you know, uh, as your review area because that is uh, again clinically very significant and um, um, it's it's um, you know it's important to uh, diagnose it even if it's small. So generally, when we look at a chest X-ray, you can you can characterize what you see um, as if the, if the, for example, if there was a um, abnormality, you can characterize it into being too white, or too black, or too large, or in the wrong place. So. Um, I think most of the um, abnormalities in the lungs can we can fit them into one of these categories. So, um, so when you look at an X-ray, you can first determine: is it too black? Oh, is there an abnormality? Is it too white? Is it too black? Is it too large, or in the wrong place? So let's um, go through some examples now. Um, what I think I'm going to do is a show. Uh, an x-ray and I want you guys to look at it. I'll give you about 30 seconds to one minute. Uh, I want it to be more interactive so um, uh, you can see the chest x-ray and uh, think, you know you it's most of them are obvious abnormalities and and then there are a couple of them which are subtle. So um, I want you to write what you think in the diagnosis and message uh, on the chat box. And, uh, and then I can explain the x-ray and then go to the next one, if that's okay. So, this is our first x-ray. I'm just gonna give 30 seconds to one minute and then talk about it.
Right. Okay. So, um, so let's discuss about this X-ray. I think you can all appreciate that the um, this looks abnormal. Uh, yes, some of you have said it's tension pneumothorax, left side to white. Um, yes, um, hyperinflation and left white out. Yeah, white out. Yeah, well done. So the first, this is, you know, you first of all, you have to determine whether the abnormality is right being too black or left being too white. And if you see on the, on the, on the left, there are still lung markings. So it's not pneumothorax. So the abnormality actually is the left side and it is the white out lung as somebody, as, as few of you have mentioned. So, um, so it's, it's, it comes under the category of too white, the abnormality. Now, the next thing we do is to determine because there are a few things that can cause whiteness uh, or density on an X-ray. So then you have to determine whether it is homogeneous and whether it is causing a uh, shift of the mediastinum towards the abnormality or opposite to the uh, opposite lung uh, or opposite side. And then also if there was some air bronchograms. So if you look at this white out lung, which is the abnormal side, you can appreciate that even though it looks like homogeneous, you can see some air bron bronchograms and these, these little uh, linear uh, dark, uh, you know, darker, darker uh, linear shadows are the air bronchograms. Uh, so this is a case of, um, uh, of left pneumonia or consolidation. And you can see that there is no, even though there is no volume loss and or, or neither actually, uh, you know, increase in volume. So it's kind of similar. Uh, there's no volume loss or it is. And also the most important thing to see is that there is um, a loss of definition of the hard border and the mediastinum here on the left and also um, the left hemidiaphragm. So this is called a silhouette sign, silhouette sign, which uh, is nothing but loss of border of certain organs, which help us determine what the abnormality and where the position of the abnormality. So this is in the left lung and it's a consolidation. So this is the second uh, X-ray. Have a look at it and, um, and uh, you know, see what you think. Yeah, so people have said pneumonectomy, good thinking, effusion, yeah. yeah. Pneumothorax on the left, okay. Tracheal deviation, that's correct. Right, okay. Yeah, left lung collapse. Okay, so let's discuss this x-ray. Um, interesting thinking. So basically, on this film, the abnormal side is the right one. And I'll explain you why. First of all, it's called the white out lung again. And you can see when compared to the previous x-ray that this is more homogeneous and does not have air bronchograms. Can you appreciate that? And also, looking at the uh, mediastinum, the trachea, the, the hard shadow is all pushed to the opposite side. So there must be something filling in the right lung, which is causing deviation of the mediastinum and trachea to the opposite side. So it cannot be collapse or pneumonectomy because in pneumonectomy and collapse, you would expect to be a volume loss. And so the trachea and the mediastinum would be actually pulled in, rather pushed in, okay? So this is a case of homogeneous um, 
a consolidated, oh, sorry, homogeneous opacity with no air bronchograms and uh, deviation of the mediastinum to the opposite side. So this is a case of a large right-sided pleural effusion. And you can also appreciate again, there is loss of heart border, there's loss of diaphragm. You can see the diaphragm on the left is very well seen, but the right is lost. Again, the silhouette sign, the chest x-ray, the most important, one of the most important sign is the silhouette sign. Everything, because we are just looking at one image in a 2D, the silhouette sign will give us a clue as to where exactly, or not always, but most of the time we can locate the abnormality. So this is a right-sided pleural effusion. Okay, so this is the third X-ray. Have a look at it and see what you think. Right, okay, so few of you have said right collapse, yeah, good. Mm, tracheal deviation to the right, yes. Right collapse again, most of you are thinking it's right collapse. Anybody thought of, uh, uh, yeah, right pneumonectomy, yeah, well done. So, um, this is a case of right pneumonectomy, as rightly said by some of, some of you, but it could, again, um, the, th the features to look for is, again, the white opacification, which is homogeneous um, and uh, no lung markings whatsoever. It's, it's all uh, homogeneous. And also the main important um, thing is the loss of volume. So the deviation of the trachea and the mediastinum is towards the abnormality. And, um, and also again, uh, silhouette sign. So there's no distinction of hard border on the right side, no distinction or, or definition of the right hemidiaphragm. So um, this could easily be, uh, you know, collapse right lung, complete collapse. But uh, if uh, the things to look for in a pneumonectomy is first thing is asking patient if the patient has had any previous surgery and then, you know, this is a pneumonectomy case. And the second thing is most of the time you can see uh, missing ribs, um, especially for pneumonectomy. I think you look for missing fifth rib, but it can be you know, above or below. So there will be a missing rib. And also you can see how the, um, the normal left lung has hyperinflated, compensate for the, you know, the deficit on the right side. And, uh, and it's also herniated towards a bit of in the apices as well. So you can see some aeration here. It's not as dense as in the lower zones here. So um, there's herniation of uh, the, uh, the hyperinflated lung towards the right as well. So this is a case of right pneumonectomy. Very good. So we'll go into the next chest X-ray and I'll give you 20 seconds. Yep. Right. Any thoughts? Right low low collapse, right sided consolidation. 
right middle zone, low zone consolidation, very good. So now we're dealing with low bar collapses, okay? So this case, let's see what are the uh, positive features. So when you compare the lung volumes, there's definite decrease in the lung volume on the right compared to the left, yeah? Uh, some of you have said right diaphragm palsy, uh, maybe not because we there is uh, elevation of the diaphragm, but also the uh, the uh, opacity here, which is not explained, isn't it? So, um, uh, so there is loss of volume compared to this. And because there's loss of volume, there is elevation of the diaphragm. The second thing is if you see the hilum there, which is not really defined because of the, again, silhouette sign, because, uh, uh, but then the, the is, is in this, in the same levels, it's kind of, it's um, elevated. And um, there is also this haziness, which is uh, uh, along the right heart border. So you've lost the definition of the right heart border. Can you see the left heart border? It has a distinct line there, but you can, you can no more draw a line here. So this is a case of uh, actually a combination. I can show you uh, here, this was the CT finding. So this is a combination of right upper lobe because there was deviation and elevation of the right, uh, right hilum and a significant loss of volume and middle lobe. So this is upper lobe and middle lobe, uh, sorry, collapse. This is a case of a lobar collapse, but you know, um, uh, both together. Well done. So one more, um, one more pathology that it's not pathology, but one more condition you need to uh, remember when you see some haziness around the right heart border with loss of definition of the right heart border is spectrum excavatum. It almost looks like um, it almost looks like the right middle lobe collapse, just the right middle lobe where the loss of a heart border and then some some haziness uh, along it, but there is difference. Um, you need to uh, first thing is ask a history. So if you ask the patient and then examination of the patient. So if, if in doubt, you can ask, examine the patient, then, then you, it's very obvious when you examine the chest, it's very obvious if, if the patient has spectus excavatum. Second thing is there's no loss of volume. There's no, absolutely the right lung is as, you know, um, as um, uh, aerated as the left lung. And the third thing is, if you uh, look at the orientation of the ribs, it's very subtle, but um, you know, when you see more and more, you'll, try, you'll appreciate it that there's more horizontal placement of the ribs and there's this acute angle. It, it's almost like a heart shape. If you follow one rib, for example, like that, it's all, it is almost making like a heart shape here. So, um, and of course, if you're uh, if you if you want confirmation, the lateral X-ray is best, and sometimes you, you can also pick it up on the CT. So, this is the next X-ray, and I'll give you some time. So um, what have you been thinking? Hyperinflation. Yeah, it, it is actually, I agree with you. There's a bit of hyperinflation looking at the left lung. Lung meds. Yeah. I see why some of you think it's lung med, but actually it's the, uh, it's the bone and the costochondral junctions that look like there's something going on there. Um, heart failure. Um, it's an AP film. If you look at that, it's an AP Eric film. So uh, the heart uh, heart is not enlarged, um, allowing for AP projection. Is this a child? Yes, it is uh, young. Yeah, it's bronchiectasis. Um, right tracheal deviation. Yeah, I agree there is right tracheal deviation. 
Okay, so this is a case of um, right lower lobe collapse. This is the importance of review area behind the heart. If you can see, there are two borders for heart. This is the normal border, and you can see there's a triangle or a sail shape density just in the right, uh, you know, just next to the, uh, behind the heart. So um, this is the collapsed right lower lobe. And what it has done is loss of uh, right hemidiac from definition here on the medial aspect. And you can also see that maybe you can appreciate the, the uh, left hilum here, but you can't see right hilum here because it's been pulled into the collapse. So um, it's kind of moved downwards. So yes, there, you know, comparing right from the left, yes, there is some volume loss in here. So this is a case of um, a right lower lobe collapse. So looking for the sail, sail shape or triangular shape uh, opacity behind the heart and loss of hemidiaphragm on the right. Well done. Oh. Okay, so I think I've uh, missed the one that you can ask, you can see what it is, but yeah, this is a case of left upper lobe collapse. So things to look for in the left upper lobe. First of all, it's difficult to spot. It's really difficult because because the um, upper lobe is anteriorly placed in the left lung. It's when it collapses, it just forms like a whale-like opacity on the left lung. So the things to look for is a whale-like opacity, uh, just increasing the density subtly more than the opposite lung. And then also a minimal loss of uh, volume when compared to the opposite lung and uh, loss of hard border. So, um, you can see that the hard border is not very well defined like we've seen in the previous chest x-rays. Um, and also um, a position of the hilum, uh, you know, it, it, it sometimes can be higher, a little bit higher than uh, expected. So, so this is a case of left upper lobe collapse. And as I say, this is one of the, one of the uh, subtle find, you know, one of the uh, difficult lobar collapse to diagnose. But uh, once you've seen it, once you, you know, go through the silhouette sign, the volume loss, the density, uh, you should be able to pick it up. Next one. What do you guys think? So, so somebody thought there could be air under the diaphragm. I think that's the gastric bubble, <laughs> but that's a good thinking. Okay. Left lower lobe collapse. Okay. Yes, I think um, left lower colla lobe collapse is um, uh, yeah is correct. So you can see again exactly how we saw on the other one, right lower lobe collapse. This is the left side. So you see the sail sign and you see the double hard border. So you see the double hard border there. That's one and that's the other one. So that's the normal hard border, what's normal. And then this is again, another triangular shape opacity, which is homogeneous and behind the right heart, right heart. So this is another reason why we have to make sure we look at the review area as retrocardiac or behind the heart, because this can be subtle and missed if you don't look for it. And uh, there is some volume loss, definitely, when compared to the right. Uh, and again, I can't appreciate the hilum here. Can you see the hilum here, that concave thing there, the obtuse angle there? So um, that's, the, that's the right hilum, but the left hilum is, is pu pulled downwards into the collapse. So this is um, left lower lobe collapse. Yeah. 
it was, uh, this is the CT, which confirmed the left lower lobe collapse. So when the left lower lobe collapses, it's posterior. So it, that's how it looks on the CT. Can you see that opacity when compared to that right side? Right. Next one, I think this is pretty obvious, but I wanted to discuss how we approach it. Right, um, I see the chat that somebody wants to look at the sale sign again. Okay, I'm just gonna go back. And so basically because there's lower lobe uh, collapse, the, the um, definition of the left hemidiaphragm is lost. So as you can draw a line on the right diaphragm, you can no more do a line on the uh, diaphragm because they're still out sign. And can you see this density here? It's almost like a sail there. Or, or a triangle, or a triangle, yeah. It, this is more obvious. Sometimes it's smaller than this, sometimes it's bigger than this. So it, it can vary. Right, okay. What do you guys think of this one? Left side, a tumor, somebody says, very good. Yeah, um, yes. Lung mass, yeah. I think it's pretty obvious. I've taken a really big lesion, that's very obvious. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, the more important thing is I wanted to discuss how we approach when we see um, a solitary lung mass or which is also a coin lesion. So basically when you see a lung mass, the things that you need to look for is, are the borders irregular? Okay, this seems to have a really round and well-defined border. Generally malignancy, you know, if it is, meta, if it is uh, a cancer, it has speculated irregular border to it. Uh, is there any cavitation? For this, I don't see any cavitation. It's really smooth. And are there any calcification? Because some, um, some um, malignancy are more uh, with calculation, ca calcification within it, and some don't. So that's an, and, and in general, if it is benign, long standing, they can have some calcification. So that kind of points you towards benign or malignant. Uh, are there any uh, adjacent rib that's been destroyed by the mass? Because if it is malignant lesion, that will cause uh, destruction of the adjacent ribs, which looks okay here. And are there any lymph nodes, mainly in the hilar region, hilar and the mediastinum? So um, if there was a, ma a malignant mass in the lung, it would expect some lymph nodes, hilar and mediastinal and superclavicular, so on. So it's important to check that. And also pleural effusions. Are there pleural effusion, especially one-sided? So if there was a lung tumor on, on left, you'd expect there would be some unilateral uh, pleural effusion on the same side. Um, so these are the things when you when you see a coin lesion or a solitary uh, mass in a lung, these are the things. And, and one more thing is the location of it, just to um, determine that it is in the ling lung and not the pleura. Yeah. So one of the things you look for is the angle that it that the mass makes to the uh, chest wall. Uh, and if it makes an acute angle, then it's probably in the lung. And sometimes you can see that the mass has an obtuse angle like that, which means it's probably in the um, in the pleura, or or you know beyond, like in the soft tissue or ribs or something like that. So then it makes an obtuse angle. I have another example which I can show you. So this one uh, turned out to be a benign lesion, but quite sizable, and it hadn't changed for many years. Uh, but uh, uh, these are the things you, you look for and comment on when you're looking for a lesion, solitary lesion in the lung. So, um, 
this one I just wanted to show. Um, this is a okay. I think I'll give you some some few seconds to go through it and say what you think. Yeah, can it, somebody says cannonball lesion perfect. Yeah, so um, this is um, lung metastasis. So they they are like fluffy nodule nodular shadowing throughout the lung more so in the lower lobes because of the increased blood supply to the lower lobes and they are of varying sizes and if uh, it depends if it was um if it was a primary from a sarcoma or a few other like malignant melanoma you would expect some uh, some uh, cavitation within them but in general or or if it was um uh, a uh, sarcoma again you could expect some calcification within them but gen in general these are cannonball appearance and in keeping with lung metastasis well done Mets, yeah so this one Let's give 30 seconds and see what you guys think. I think this is a bit more subtle than what we've seen so far, uh, but uh, it will be interesting to see if you guys can pick up the lesion or abnormality. Yes, some of you thought there's something in the in the right episodes. Mm -hmm. Can anybody be more specific? Right hilar abnormality, uh, pancoast tumor, right clavicle more prominent. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that you die, you, you people are thinking in the right area, and uh, yeah, so well done. Basically, um, you've said right apex. So when it is an abnormality in the apex, you would see it as in just that portion mostly, and you could see it different from there. But here, if you follow my, uh, you know, my pointer, I can. I can actually draw a line up till here like that, which looks much denser than compared to the left side. And it's got that concave border to it. So this is a classical example of right, widening of the right paratracheal stripe that I was speaking as one of the review areas. So, um, if you can appreciate, it, this is much denser than the left side. It's got a concave border and there's widening. It's way beyond five millimeter, three or three to five millimeter. So, so um, now I can show you the CT for this patient. Can you see? This was a large superior mediastinal mass, which was causing widening of the paratracheal stripe on the right. It's uh, it can be really subtle, but you know, sat very satisfying when you find out. Right, next X-ray. We'll give it some time. So concentrate more on the right side. Left side, I know it's a bit busy. It looks like there's uh, increased lung markings, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's a bit uh, uh, over penetrated. So don't worry about the left side. Right hilar congestion. Yeah, something's going on, going on in the right hilum. Yeah, I agree. Right hilar dilation okay yeah 
so yeah, uh, you guys have found the abnormal abnormality that it's something to do with right hilum, isn't it? So I was telling when you review the hilum, there are three things that you look for. One is the position. Actually here, you can't even make the position because it, it's kind of lost the hilar look of it, like you see here on the left side, first thing. Second thing is, it's got that concave something there. Can you see? That's just very concave. It's no more having that Con, sorry, convex. I'm sorry. So it's got that convex convexity to it, whereas the the left hilum is still normal, and you can see that it's got that concave border to it. And when comparing the left with the right, you can see that it's increased in density, definitely, and it's lost the the right hand border is kind of fussed out. So um, and also just just to note that there's a fracture of the rib here. Okay, so this, when we did a CT, this was what we saw. So there was a big right hilar mass. And that's why, you know, the right hilum was denser than the left. Well done. So this case, again, so we're talking about something in the right hilum. So it's again right hilar mass. You can see you can still appreciate the concavity here, but then you know you know that there is something going on here, which was which is not seen on the left side. So um, and it's it's just not density, isn't it? Because the last one you saw that it was more dense, but this one seemed to be a bit uh, inhomogeneous or heterogeneous. So this can anybody tell? what it could be. Right, lymph node enlargement, yeah. But um, I'm expecting what kind of lymph node? Hamartoma, yeah. Uh, if it was just lymph node, I would expect it to be homogeneous density. But this looks a bit heterogeneous, isn't it? Cavitating mass, yes, absolutely correct. So this is a cavitating mass and you can see some fluid level maybe here, but, but this is got the border to it and then it's got loose and uh, center to it. So this is a cavitating lesion and this, yeah. So this is how it looked on the CT. So when, you, when you're dealing with a cavitating lesion, the questions you need to ask and look for is, is it single or are there multiple cavitating lesions? And when it is single and large like this, you have to look at the borders to see if it is thick walled or thin walled, because there are three, there are three things that can be, uh, uh, that can present as a single, large cavitating lesion. One can be carcinoma, abscess, and TB. So if it is a malignancy, then it'll have a thick wall to it. And if it's abscess, it generally it's thin wall, but it, you know, it, it always uh, overlaps the findings. And also look for any fluid levels within it, which is very important. That shows kind of the, you know, active process happening, or is it like chronic long standing um, and also sometimes you, you can see some soft tissue um, ball in it and that is typical and it's like an aunt mini when we see a soft tissue ball within a cavitating large cavitating lesion we think of aspergilloma and uh, generally aspergilloma happens in a patient who is immunocompromised so uh, whether it's an HIV patient or uh, or a TB especially T a cavitating lesion because of the TB there can be aspergilloma complication so uh, yeah Good. So can anybody spot the abnormality? I think with the projection of the X-ray, you should be already able to guess what I'm looking for. So 
sorry, somebody has mentioned the, the previous, could it be, um, sorry, could it be a bullet? And the answer is uh, unlikely because if you see, it's got such thick wall and uh, uh, bullets don't have thick wall to them. They're very, very thin, thin, very thin wall to it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's unlikely unless the bulla is infected. Shoulder surgery ribs broken dislocation i think i'm more um looking for lung abnormality the bones are all right pneumothorax there we go yes so pneumothorax is very important diagnosis on x-ray and um, when I was getting trained, the, I started to look for any any X-rays. I started to first rule out pneumothorax and then start looking at everything else because it's important. And uh, the things to look for, can you see? That is the lung margin. So you 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 will be able to see the lung edge when in pneumothorax, and uh, if you can appreciate, there are lung markings up till uh, up till the the line there, and then there are no lung markings past it, because there's no lung there. There's only air in the in the pneumothorax there. So um, so always when diagnosing pneumothorax, apical pneumothorax thorax, uh, pneumothorax can be subtle. So uh, look for the lung edges if necessary, and that's why I've put this uh, projection because. To, uh, to rule out pneumo small pneumothorax or subtle pneumothorax, you need to uh, zoom it to the apices and sometimes change the contrast. And uh, you can also see, um, you know, if it is large enough, then the media stand will shift towards the opposite side. And um, also, importantly, uh, when you see a pneumothorax, yeah, it can be spontaneous, but also look for any cause, causative factor, like uh, is there a bull, bulla which is ruptured? Um, is there a rib fracture? Is the patient had a trauma or, you know, um, road traffic accident? And is there a fracture or is there a shoulder dislocation? Uh, those are all quite relevant because that can cause pneumothorax. <sighs> So this one, I just wanted to uh, show this one uh, because this is pneumothorax, but uh, it's, uh, it's a tension pneumothorax, which is potentially fetal and needs immediate intervention. So it's a medical emergency. So we should never you know, miss this and um, it's an urgent finding. So um, the lung you can see is completely collapsed in the medial aspect the whole of this is filled with air so this is a this is a large left-sided pneumothorax and i i'm sure you can appreciate there are no lung markings when compared to the right here can you see that's all the lung markings but you can no more see the lung markings there so this is kind of comes in the category of too dark and uh, and also the most important thing for um, telling that this is a tension pneumothorax is when there is significant deviation of the trachea. Can you see? It's not no more central. It's gone towards the opposite side and the heart. It's almost like the heart is pushed completely towards the right side. So, um, okay. So, um, so this is a tension pneumothorax. And if ever you come across this, it's a medical emergency and you know, you need to have an in immediate intervention. So somebody wants to look at the, um, look at the previous one with the subtle pneumothorax. So this is it. Um, so this is the lung edge. If you take a pencil, for example, that's how I see if it, the margin is, you know, the edge is seen. If you take a pencil and you should be able to draw a line there, like a crisp line, and you see there is no lung markings past it, like you see here. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Any ideas what this is?
Yes. Um, someone has said cardiomegaly. Yes, I agree. Tamponade. Yes. Very good. Heart failure. Right. Then they might. Yeah. There is some. Yeah. Congestion. Pericardial effusion. Yeah. Perfect. So this is a case of pericardial effusion, and um, yes. Uh, you know, it is basically enlargement of the cardiac shadow, but then the shape of it is slightly uh, odd when compared to normal cardiomegaly. So this is almost like a, uh, like a, you know, globe or a football shape. And, um, and yes, there, there, there is some uh, degree of heart failure, I guess. So when we did the CT, it's, this is how it looked. Can you see this is pericardial effusion? So this is the normal heart and it should just have a thin line surrounding it with no fluid, you know, very, very trace of fluid, which we can't generally appreciate. And if you see the this uh, from the x-ray patient, you can see that there is some soft tissue, like, you know, there is some fluid completely en encasing the heart. So this is a case of pericardial effusion and Possibly patient is in tamponade. Yes, it's again, you know, something that you have to, um, you have to uh, flag up. Well done. So this one. Yes, um, some of you have suggested, yeah, most of you have said the right thing. Nemoperitoneum, air under the right hemidiaphragm. Well done. I consider this X-ray as a subtle finding and um, it becomes more obvious when you do the review areas and go under the diaphragm. So it's important to again, you know, do the review areas. So can you see that line? And so there is a lucent line under the diaphragm. So the, the, the um, advantage of doing a erect chest X-ray for query, uh, air the, sorry, query Nemo peritoneum is that it can detect as low as 10 mL of gas. So it's quite specific and um, sensitive as well. So this one, uh, uh, on the right side, generally, if there was air under the diaphragm on the right side, it's much more easier to diagnose than the left side. Only reason being, you know, somebody mentioned about the uh, air under the diaphragm for the gas bubble in the in the stomach. So that is the difficulty. You know, the gas has, a, you know, the stomach has a gas bubble always, most of the time. And then it's quite difficult whether to, you know, determine this is gas under the diaphragm or the gas bubble. Um, so the, the points, so somebody is asking me, how do you differentiate? So the points to differentiate the, the um, air bubble in the stomach, stomach bubble basically, and the gas under the left hemidiaphragm is, you know how, can you, can you appreciate the diaphragm? It's a thin line. So um, if there was an air under the diaphragm, it should be a thin line above it, whereas in the in the uh, stomach bubble, there's a thick line above it because it's it's obviously other you know soft tissue, and um, and also the lucency is more like a crescent shape, uh, which would be here. But if it was a stomach bubble, as you saw on the previous X-ray, it's more like a rounded or oval shaped. So uh, so that other features you know you would differentiate from a gas bubble. Um, so yeah. It can be subtle sometimes, but it's it's uh, it, and it has to be erect chest X-ray. So this is very subtle finding. I would want to see if anybody can pick it up.
So somebody suggested emphysema. Um, I see, yeah, it's, it's well um, inflated, but uh, yeah. Rib fracture, is it right, left? Left-sided hemothorax, right rib fracture. Um, left lower lobe consolidation right it's not the left lower lobe consolidation because i think i think i know what you're seeing it looks like there's a triangle here but actually that this is a female patient and always remember if there was a female patient you have to um you have to consider the breast shadow so this is her left breast and the right one so that that's what it making look like a triangular uh, opacity behind heart, but it's actually not. And this is almost like straight and hard, hard border. There's no double border here. Le somebody's mentioned left rib bony med, and I agree. So that was very subtle and well done for finding it out. Because when you follow uh, bones, then you come to this and suddenly there is an expansile lesion in the left rib. So uh, counting one, two, three, four, five, sixth rib. So can you see the cortex should always be, you should be able to write in a pencil. Uh, the, the cortex should be able, should be traced with a pencil. And when you can see that it's, and then suddenly you kind of lose it. And then it's kind of expansile there. So if I draw around it, so that's, so that is um, a metastasis on the rib. And can you see that opacity? It's kind of making an obtuse angle. If you, I mean, it's it's not the ideal case, but if you see, it's actually making an obtuse and it's not making an acute angle. So we know this is something not in the lung, but outside the lung in the chest wall. So when we did the CT, this is what we found. Can everybody appreciate? So th these are the ribs. And then suddenly there is an expansile. Uh, destructive lesion with some soft tissue component and pleural thickening. So this is in keeping with metastasis. I just put this chest x-ray to uh, show you guys, it can be, you know, everything is not just one pathology and uh, straightforward and looks, you know, uh, crystal clear, some chest x-ray is, is so um, uh, complicated. It can be very, very tough sometimes. And uh, especially when the patient is in ITU, there's an AP projection line, you know, supine, and the patient is in recess. There's so many things you need to look at the um, tubes and the positions, and these are all the uh, ECG wires. And then there's, you can see there is this this line here, that's because the patient has got pneumomediastinum. Um, so you can see there is some lucency here between this line and the, and the hard border. So this is the uh, gas in the, so it's basically pneumomediastinum. And can you see some bubbly shadows here? Uh, lucency, so the, this is uh, um, surgical emphysema in the neck. And uh, there's some opacity here. So, uh, so basically I put this one to show that, you know, when there's so many things going on, uh, uh, you know, you need to calm down and say, okay, I'll, I'll review one area after the other and find what all, there might be multiple uh, findings. So uh, just um, a, a systematic approach would, would really help in this as well. So um, well done, all of you. I think most of you. Um, I, I hope. I hope that you know uh, most of you have uh, got uh, an insight of you know uh, findings on the chest X-ray. We'll also go through some of the cases of the NG tube uh, placement, or uh, you know, on looking at the NG tube positions on the chest X-ray. Um, 
because again, you know, you uh, as medical um, as uh, junior registrars, it's where you know you face it again. So NG tube placed uh, generally in patients who need feeding uh, or for aspiration purposes, uh, or sometimes when the patient has got obstruction or something, so they need uh, gastric decompression. Um, so. Um, when the NG tube is in position, we call the NG tube is in position when the tip of the NG tube is at least 10 centimeters beyond the gastroesophageal junction. And the reason for this is um, generally you can see the tip of the NG tube as a dense, uh, dense, you know, denser than the normal tube itself. So when you see then you know that that's the NG tube. And the other thing is the NG tube itself has some holes, uh, side holes in the distal end. So if you didn't, you know, uh, advance the NG tube 10 centimeters beyond the gastroesophageal junction, then maybe the, the, you know, the holes are in the uh, lower esophagus than being in the stomach. So that's the reason that, you know, you always make sure that the uh, NG tube is advanced 10 centimeters beyond the gastroesophageal junction. Um, I'm straight going into the NG tube in a wrong position. Uh, so this is a case where um, you can see that the NG tube, can you see that's the NG tube? And I, as I said, the NG tube tip of the NG tube is dense. So you can see, first of all, it's not gone beyond the gastroesophageal junction. And also one more clue is you can always, always generally appreciate the tracheal deviation. So it has to be below it. If it hasn't advanced below it, then you have to look where it has gone. And then you can, if you follow it, you can see that it's straight gone into the right lower lobe bronchus there. So these cases, when it goes to the lower lobe bronchus or in the lung, then there is a risk of aspiration because patient, you know, is being fed. Uh, so that's, that's the importance of making a, you know, making sure it's in the right position. So again, another case where you know, can you see the dense line there? So this is the NG tube and you can follow it like that. And then has it come down below the tracheal deviation? It hasn't. Have you, can you see any in, in below the uh, gases of wave junction? No, the line that you're seeing here is the pacemaker wire. Can you see, you can follow it all to the pacemaker there. So it's in the left ventricle and the right atrium, the another one. So this is a dual lead uh, pacemaker. So the, the, the NG tube itself, you can follow it. It's again gone into the right, uh, right main, you know, lower low bronchi and into the lung actually. Again, risk of aspiration. So this has to be removed. This is a case where NG tube is in the left lung with left-sided pneumothorax. So if you follow the NG tube, it's gone. All, uh, there are other lines like the central line and other things. But if you concentrate on the denser tip here, this is the NG tube. So if you see it's followed and can you see it below the tracheal deviation? You cannot because it's gone into the left main, uh, left lower lobe bronchus and all the way outside the lung and, and has caused pneumothorax on the left side. Can you see there's no lung marking and it's too dark and it's caused collapse of this lung here. So this is a case where NG tube was in the left lung causing left side of pneumothorax. So that's another uh, complication. Uh, one is aspiration we spoke about, the other one is the pneumothorax. This is extreme cases. I just wanted to show you guys. Uh, uh, this was a case. I mean, I, the, one of the consultant radiographer just provided me with these images. Uh, but if you can appreciate, uh, this patient had a no traffic accident and he had Lee 40 fracture, which means like the base of skull fracture. Uh, I don't know the degree of it or anything, but then if you can see the NG tube in, instead of going uh, uh, downwards has actually gone upwards and has gone all the way uh, penetrating the fracture bit into the brain. So it's actually in the brain. Can you see? It's in the brain. So this is extreme. After, no, it's, it doesn't generally happen. And uh, this is another extreme case. Can you see the NG tube? This is the 
you know, this axial view of the CT bone window. And you can see that this is the nasal cavity. It's penetrated the posterior nasal fossa and, and then all the way sphenoid sinus and it's gone through it and reached, if you can see on the sagittal view, you can see how it's gone through it to go into the spinal canal. I've never seen this before again. Right, so we've come to the end of it now. And uh, the take home message for chest X-ray review is a systematic approach is the key. Uh, and the chances of missing things are very mm -hmm. unlikely if you go, if you have a system and you approach every chest X-ray the same way as you do. And of course, when in doubt, we are all, the radiologists are always there to help you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Rika. I certainly learned quite a lot this evening and uh, I'll definitely apply it when I go into my next shift. Um, you should all get feedback linked, emailed through to you in the next five, ten minutes or so. Um, I will also paste it onto the chat box as well for this session. Um, once you fill in the feedback forms, you should get a certificate that will get sent straight to your email that you registered with. Um, so next Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. this time, so this time next week, uh, Dr. Hughes will be presenting um, an approach, common cases and pitfalls of abdominal and pelvic x-rays. Uh, next Saturday morning at 11 a.m., um, Dr. DeBall will be starting off the plain film sessions for MSK. So he'll be starting on the approach to hand and wrist x-ray interpretations. I'll pop all this down in the chat box below. Um, also, in, that I'll put in the chat box is the link to register for those sessions. So don't forget to sign up for that or you'll miss out. And the last link that I'll put in is um, the link to the Mind of the website where you can sign up to all the webinars. Um, I will just give it about 30 seconds to a minute, just in case anyone has any questions about this session. Um, and then after that, if there are no questions, then we'll wrap up. So I'll just give it about a minute or so just to see if there are any questions. Oh, sorry, I think I had muted myself. Um, so, Rekha, there is a question. Uh, can you explain the first case again? Um, they've said there are, they know what you mean by air bronchograms. How do you differentiate whether it is pleural effusion or consolidation? Yeah, of course. So I'll have to go back to... So I'll show you. Um, I'll show you all the first one, which was uh, consolidation, and then compare it with the second one. So this was the first one, which is consolidation, and we, and and then can you see that there is some blackness in it, and it's not really homogeneous. It's some blackness there, and if you actually carefully look at it, it's linear coming towards the hilum. So these are the air bronchograms that we see. But if you see the next one, keep this in your mind and then see the next one. Does it have any blackness in it? No, not at all. It's very, very homogeneous and no air bronchogram. Right, so I have, I have popped in the chat box um, the links to all the various things I said earlier. So 24th at 8 p.m. So 24th of November, that's the 
abdominal and pelvis uh, plane films. And then on Saturday, the 27th of November at 11 in the morning, I'm afraid this one's on the weekend, um, we'll start the MSK plane film uh, series. So that's hand and wrist on Saturday, uh, which is notoriously quite difficult to interpret. Um, and then the last link is just to sign up for all the Mind Bleep webinar series. So that's radiology and there's a lot of other ones on there. There's a medicine series and the urology series too. Um, someone has put, so the first one is pneumonia, is it? I think you've muted yourself, Rekha. Yes, that's correct. The first one is pneumonia and the second one is fuel effusion, which doesn't have mm -hmm. air bulk Fantastic. Um, someone has put, where is the gastroesophageal junction on the chest x-ray? Right, let's go back to, uh, yeah. So if this is the normal, yeah, this is the normal chest x-ray. And you, in fact, we can never see esophagus until it's dilated. And if it has air in it or fluid level in it, we'll never be able to see because it's a soft tissue and it will merge with the soft tissue in the, in the mediastinum. So um, we should assume, can you see the gastric bubble there? That is the gastric bubble, which I said it's either round or oval. And so basically the junction would be at this where, you know, the diaphragm meets the spinal junction here. So it, it kind of uh, goes through there. that's are all the questions so don't forget to sign up to the future sessions if you click on uh, the mind the bleep profile on medal you should be able to see all the radiology ones that we have coming up so they're generally weekly up until mid-january um with a break over christmas time because i don't think anyone wants to be um looking at webinars over around christmas new year time um, someone has put, can we have a QR code for feedback? Um, let me try and sort that out for you now. Give me a second. Right, so I've had, let me see if I can put this in the group chat because it's come up as an image. I don't think it's impossible to get you the QR code. Um, do you have the, if you look in your email, you should have a link to be able to get the feedback so you can get your certificate. Um, if you can't do that, then um, if you email mind the bleep, so that's mind the bleep at gmail.com, um, then we can send you a QR code on that. All right. Um, so if there are no other questions, then we'll wrap up the session. So this does get recorded and it should be uploaded on, on Medal afterwards. So you can um, watch it again if you've missed anything during the session. All right, I don't think there are any other questions. So thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Don't forget to fill in the feedback and I'll see you next Wednesday. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Thank you. Bye.